bundle of questions here that, um, that people have submitted, and I, I've collected together a few on a, the theme of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, one says, I read recently that this year's conference of the Royal College of Psychiatrists was the first in many years to decline corporate sponsorship from Big Pharma. Is this due to the important campaigns highlighting the problems inherent in this relationship, and does it represent a shift in perspective of the psychiatric profession? And um, I was responsible for writing a letter to the BMJ to point this out, because the Royal College of Psychiatrists were actually keeping it very quiet that they didn't have sponsorship, and I think they were doing that so that they can have sponsorship next year if they decide to. Um, but it is now in the BMJ that uh, uh, congratulating them on not having it. Um, and uh, another one is, what attempts have been made to pass legislation that would require drug companies to provide full disclosure of all trial information? Would this not be a good way forward? I wondered if panelists wanted to comment on that. And um, there was another one about Senator Grassley in the US, who's been instrumental in, in exposing the financial conflicts of interest between academics and big pharma most recently resulting in Charles Nemiroff's resignation from Emory University. He, for those of you who don't know, he was a, he's a very prominent academic psychiatrist um, and editor of a major psychiatric journal, and it was revealed that he hadn't declared his conflict of interest, his numerous links with pharmaceutical companies, and um, for that reason he's, he's had to resign. And Senator Grassley has also exposed other leading academics who have not been declaring the full and very large extent of their um, financial connections with Big Pharma. And I just thought that was an interesting question because in some ways, America is, it, it, it is actually taking a lead in, in this area. And other the developments in America that are interesting are the Association of Mer American Medical Colleges has recently come up with a policy um, which is banning all um, influence of big pharma on medical education, no gifts in teaching hospitals, not, not even post-it notes or pens, um, and, and no influence on, on educational events. And th that could qu have quite a big impact in America and I think is, is showing us the way forward. So that was the little lot on pharmaceutical industry. Does anyone want to comment? <laughs> The, the point about uh, identifying the people who receive mega support from industry money, uh, the academic re uh, reps, that will be, that is coming more into the open. The point about hiding data, uh, the MHRA has said it would stop that. It would make rules that made that illegal and uh, they would pursue people who hide data. I think those are the two things I can answer easily. There were, there were other people over here, David um, and, and Charles, you wanted to make a comment? Um, publication of clinical trials, um, it only happened by accident, um, but it is happening and I suppose it represents a degree of, process, uh, of progress. The reason for secrecy, in my experience, is not to hide the information that the secret keepers have. It's actually to um, disguise or, or not to indicate how much they don't know. Um, but the danger is when you release, you know, all the data in all, all the uh, in all the detail, uh, that it is going to take years and years to wade through it. What you actually want to happen is to know that anything to do with a clinical trial, and that certainly includes conflict of interest, is going to be made available so that the people involved in the, con in the clinical trial are required in their own interests to observe a high degree of accountability. That's exactly the same with policy making in governments and why you don't, you know, why you want freedom of information. It's not so that you, if you're a you know, desk bound like me, can have more paper on your desk. It's so that you know that the people making the decisions um, are going to be subject to the discipline of, of, of public exposure. So it puts them under, an, uh, under some obligation to put them right. Ivan Ilyich said, and I'm switching slightly, he said America was, Americans were usually the first to jump onto bandwagons, but also, he said, to be fair, usually the first to jump off. The, 
conflicts of interest in the American psychiatric establishment have been shameful, absolutely disgraceful. And I've no doubt that there is an element of that here. And I just hope we jump off the bandwagon as soon as, uh, or as quickly as Senator Grassley is making things happen there. I first came across this, a disclosure by a professor at Brown University, uh, not because he disclosed the 400K he, he was making each year from the pharmaceutical companies and not disclosing, but because the Boston Globe picked up a divorce settlement where his wife asked for all, for all details of, of his uh, of his earnings and this is what transpired Charles um, with respect <laughs> you know uh, I think you're great and wonderful and all you say is right great and wonderful and all you say is right but I do want to take issue with uh, a bit of what you said far be it from me to um, support Charlie Nemiroff but I think conflict of interest in this domain is a little bit of a red herring. The pharmaceutical industry are probably awfully happy to see what Senator Grassley's doing because it makes the problem look like a few rotten apples in the barrel when the problem is the barrel, it's the system. And the key thing to that is access to the data. The companies market the drugs back to us under the banner of science. The norms and ethics of science are that we have access to the data on which claims are made. When people these days make a claim for a gene that they've just found and they want to publish in Nature or perhaps Science, they're required to post the sequence on the web. In just the same way, the pharmaceutical companies can be required to make the data available to all of us. And there's a few good reasons why they ought to. First of all, it's people like us, people in, in this room that get involved in the clinical trials that bring the drugs onto uh, the market. We take risks with these drugs that are new and risky, most of which don't end up on the market because they are too risky. We run those risks. We are injured. We do this for free. We do it for free in the hope that our wives and our husbands and our children and the communities from which we come will gain in the process. We expect when we, when we sign the informed consent form that, well, that we are going to be told what the risks are. We also expect that what's in, what, what we're actually getting involved with is a piece of science and that people will have access to the data that comes out of us being prepared to take risks. Uh, an awful lot of people, when we go into healthcare and you get told there is, a, there is a clinical trial happening and you're being told by a doctor, you know, wouldn't you like to get involved? You're often a hostage in this and you do get involved because, you know, the doctor wouldn't recommend anything awful. But again, the key thing here is we think that even though we're maybe nervous about being involved, that people will have access to the data afterwards. I think we have to insist on access to the data or at least insist that the informed consent form that we, uh, uh, that we actually sign when we get involved in trials says there will be data access, or no, there won't be data access, so we know that that's what we're actually being involved in. You know, I think without this, it's just a house of cards, and the industry are probably quite happy to see Charlie and Emeroff fall, because that takes your eye off the ball. Uh, sorry, I wanted to come back, N not only to say how wonderful I honestly think David is, uh, and always have done, and how right he was on this, but also to mention, a sp uh, I mean, just to refine what I said about uh, manageable data. Um, the, I mean, it is extraordinary, given the kind of poor quality of clinical trials, um, and it was Richard Smith, the editor of the BMJ, who said that 95% of the stuff he thought was, I think the word he used was crap, but uh, rubbish, rubbish, um, and which is uh, one hell of an indictment. What is, what is astounding is that we 
entertain the MHRA, which has been accepting this stuff for years. Now, if you wanted to do something at a stroke, I'll tell you what you should do. You should get the MHRA to require, as it is no longer legally capable of, capable of doing under EC law, to require the audits, the, the, the audits for compliance that are done with good, uh, for good clinical practice. All the MHRA are MHRA re now requires is a one-page certificate saying an audit has been done. The level of compliance on things like the reporting of adverse effects, the, uh, the securing of, of informed consent forms, all of the detail of that is buried, and the levels of compliance average about sort of 40 to 60 percent, which is a complete disgrace. So the remedy actually is in our hands as citizens. Uh, and if we had an organization responsive and competent enough to do it, uh, we'd be a lot better off than we are now. What use will be made of the huge volume of evidence on adverse reactions, adverse events given to the Health Select Committee for the inquiry? Uh, on the influence of the pharmaceutical industry, some 500 plus pages of evidence and small print and other evidence. Well, the answer is uh, we don't know. I think it's unlikely that any use will be made of it because it's not on the agenda of the medicines agency. And the medicines agency is the agency that would be responsible. And I think one of the problems with the MHRA is that we don't know what they're actually doing. They don't publish uh, how they actually assess the adverse effects or the reports. We know that the sections dealing with adverse effects are much smaller than those that are evaluating license applications. The budget is smaller. And as I said earlier, the confidentiality of the yellow card reports means that it is very difficult to get the details of the individual events that have been reported and to interpret them. Uh, Charles Nedawa and I looked at a lot of texts that we got from the MHRA on yellow cards and compared them with the re reports by patients. And the way that some of those reactions had been classified was just wrong. They were misinterpreted. They were not thought about adequately. So the people in the pharmacovigilance section of the MHRA are paid to follow very strict bureaucratic procedures. They classify them. They are box tickers and, um, and electronic archivists, but they're not paid to think. And I don't know whether who actually has the job of thinking in that division. So um, that's a long and rather pessimistic answer to this question, but I think we need some changes. Should I go on to some more questions, which were also about what to do, what, what practical action we can take as a result of today, which I thought was an important thing to address. Before I read out the questions, I wanted to just plug something that might, um, might help in that direction, which is a website um, called comingoff.com designed to help people who want to come off or reduce psychiatric medication in particular. Um, and, and it's a really excellent, very informative website designed by Rufus May and Adam Jugru and others from Bradford with input from, from lots of, um, lots of self-help groups that have focused on coming off. And the, the questions here were, the talks have been very enlightening, however, very little practical advice has been given for healthcare professionals. Should a patient needing an operation not be given an anaesthetic due to psychiatric side effects? Should a patient with an anaerobic infection not be given metronidazole? Are you suggesting greater patient counselling? I don't know how to act next. Um, and another one uh, along the same lines, which says, um, although it has been made clear there are serious risks associated with medications, would the panel accept that in some instances there are risks in choosing not to take medication, not to take medicines, in particular antibiotics? So I wondered if anyone wanted to comment on those questions and, and on the issue of 
what to do next, what practical action people can, can take and what, where people can go for practical advice and help. Uh, the first question, a Rose, was, um, uh, it was one that was actually put to me during the break, the tea break. So let me just repeat my answer, which is, just in case people w were confused in the talk that I gave, I'm not saying don't take medicines because of the side effects that they pose. What I am saying is to, to, that you oughtn't to, to, um, to put too much weight on the evidence saying that these drugs are good for you. And for sure, you should pay, pay or put extremely little weight on the evidence which says that there are no risks. You probably don't want to put much weight on the things we think we know about what these drugs do in the brain. The key thing you want to pay heed to is what is happening the person in front of you on a medicine. Either you yourself or your husband or your wife or your children or whatever. And you want to trust your judgment. If our, their judgment, if they say they're feeling strange and abnormal, and if your hunch is that they are changed, then the chances are, even if the evidence says, no, this couldn't be happening, that actually you have extremely strong evidence in your own hands. It isn't don't treat, but we should monitor everyone after they have been treated. That's the key thing, and that's what's not happening at the moment. With regard to adverse drug reactions and anaesthetics, we've now identified that at least a couple of drugs have psychiatric uh, hazard signals. And I think it's important that we collect as much information as we can, um, not just retrospectively, but prospectively. Um, and collect the right information. I think we've identified the limitations of the present system and we want that really to work for the patient benefit overall. So, but talking about the individual patient and what you do if you're going to have an anaesthetic, I find that patients' faces just light up when I say to you, what drugs do you find work best for your pain? And they will say, well, nobody's ever asked me that question before. But I think patients know what drugs work for them. And if you've had an anaesthetic in the past and it's worked well for you, I bet you don't know what it was. But I think you should know and I think you should ask. And hopefully this meeting will empower you to do that. I'm afraid the cruel truth is that every single medicine which is out there has adverse effects and almost probably every single medicine has killed somebody at some stage in some way or, or another. And I think you therefore are left having to make a judgment based on previous experience, whether it's anecdote or, or whether it's actually sort of more reliable, at least statistically, um, concerned. But my advice to the person that asked the question would be, if you're faced with that dilemma, you should empower yourself by doing as much reading around it yourself, but you should then go to somebody that you trust, both to know a lot about the answer to that question and also to treat you in a caring and compassionate way. And clearly, as a member of the medical profession, I would hope that very often that person will be your doctor. Well, as, as, a, as a patient, I'd like to think that my doctor could uh, rely on the regulatory agency. Uh, sorry to bang on about this, but I, ad I, ad uh, I wrote a 20,000 word monograph in 1997 uh, which I sent to the MHRA saying there is going to be a real problem with withdrawal from antidepressants. 
um, four inquiries and uh, five years later they finally grudgingly uh, sort of admitted this. Now what happened in the meantime and why did they resist in their inquiries? It's because their philosophy is we are scientists. Now I don't want to mock scientists, my father was a fine one and I learned at his knee that science is the cleanest way of establishing truth but when you mix science and politics, which you do when you're playing with people's lives and you're establishing risk, it is unconscionable to take the attitude that no evidence of risk equals evidence of no risk, which is exactly what the regulators do. And it is a madness. Uh, they're basically saying, show us the bodies and then we might believe you. And it's too late then, as Andrew said, you know, where on earth is somebody thinking? And they're not. So you get these dreadful clashes between common sense and science. And it's appalling that this happens. It's bad for science and it's bad for democracy. And this dreadful organization seems to happily pursue a middle path, telling people, of course, there is no such thing as a completely safe drug. Damn right there isn't. I mean, what we know about the drugs that we use um, is that, you know, probably there is, you know, the risks you run are, are, are formidable. Let me just give you another example with antidepressants, because it still happens. The conventional wisdom um, and what the MHRA says is that these drugs are beneficial. Uh, these drugs, you know, the benefit outweighs the harm. Now, what the only thing they are entitled to say on an evidence-based basis is that about one person in ten may well benefit from exposure to these drugs. Uh, and what they should be adding is that probably of the order of two uh, will suffer uh, will suffer some sort of bad reaction and that the vast majority would do just as well with or without the drug. But because they are legally charged to define drugs as either safe and acceptable or not, once the drug has, has sort of jumped through their hoops, so to speak, frequently, and certainly in the case of antidepressants, on the basis of such ropey data, I would delight in teaching my you know, young teenage granddaughter how idiotic they had been. They then license it and let it go and say it is safe. And then they have the gall to say that to treat somebody with a placebo or with a sub-therapeutic dose is unethical. Beats me. And I just wanted to add very quickly to Charles that I, I agree. I, th there seems to be an assumption that drugs are beneficial unless they're proved to be harmful. And it seems to me that the assumption should be changed the other way around. We should assume that they're harmful unless we can prove that they're not too harmful. Okay, so I'm, I'm really sorry. I know there were a lot of questions we didn't address. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to make the closing remarks. Um, Andrew Herxheimer. I'll stand up here because then I, I feel more visible and audible. It's obviously impossible to summarize the day. I thought that since the title that Millie gave us, What's Our Responsibility, was really the key. And I thought the simplest thing would be to um, consider all the different actors in the medicines scene and see what each one, each group's responsibilities are. And that gives us an agenda for what we should try to do in the, in the future and as soon as possible and start doing it now. And I'm also going to mention the golden rules that I put into the big golden rule pot. Um, now, the knowledge cascade about drugs uh, goes like this. First of all, scientists, academic scientists and scientists in public bodies like the Medical Research Council and in industry, uh, they find relevant facts about the medicines. 
then those are published and those are gathered together in review articles that give the weight of the different bits of knowledge in relation to each other. And then clinicians start to use that information in their practice. And the clinicians include specialists, GPs, nurses, and people in al allied health professions, and pharmacists. Um, and I'm sort of hesitating to call pharmacists clinicians, but they are certainly allied professionals. And then the information gets to the public, partly through media, partly from professionals. And then on the side, beside this knowledge cascade, as it were, on the banks of the knowledge cascade, which you can conceive of a broad river consisting of lots of irrelevant uh, flora and fauna and lots of water, there are the companies and the regulators who try to influence and regulate the flow of information. So what are the roles, the responsibilities of each of those groups? Well, the scientists are looking for how things work, what's really true about the medicines and about what they do. Industry also does that, but it's very selective. It looks for knowledge that favors their activity, their products. So it's very selective. Um, the clinicians uh, look for knowledge that will help them treat patients, and the, whether they're specialists or GPs. That really determines the area of their interest and their previous knowledge and how they construct their universe of personal knowledge. There's one bit that I've left out, which is experiential knowledge, which is separate from conventional scientific knowledge. It is the knowledge that comes from seeing things happen with, in your own experience, whether you're a patient or whether you're a clinician or whether you're a, a spectator, a, a member of the family, etc. So one of the things that we have to do, it's our responsibility collectively to make the scientific knowledge and the experiential knowledge of all these groups converge so that they, have, they can exist in the same universe. And this is the reason why adverse effects have been separate from the alleged benefits of medicines. Because they have the, as you've heard and repeated many times today, uh, stories of harms are not considered evidence by so-called scientists in companies and regulation and so on. We have to break that barrier. We, that barrier has to disappear. Um, that also means that we have to actually collect the experience much, much more effectively than has been done so far. The fact that patients can now, and carers can now report adverse effects on yellow cards is a step in that direction, but as I said earlier, uh, my fear is that the reports just end up in a big yellow hole. That's a variation on a black hole. Um, and that nothing meaningful emerges from that. That has got to be changed. We have to work out new methods of analyzing those effects and that hasn't been done, and we don't actually know what the best ways of analyzing them are. Actually, the uh, bit of um, research, the research methods, are the research methods of qualitative research, whereas those of the hard sciences, biology and um, uh, pharmacology and chemistry and so on, those are all quantitative sciences. 
qualitative research is looked down on and not understood by the majority of quantitative scientists. We have to change that. That'll take quite a long time, but we've got to start. And I think the adverse effects area is, and psychiatric effects especially, is a very, could be a pioneering area for that kind of convergence. I think that is very much up the street of psychiatry and psychology. Well, that's one big, big chunk of responsibility. Um, when it comes to the clinicians and the specialists, the GPs and the nurses and the pharmacists, I think the, res the responsibility is to keep up to date and to get much better at listening to what people tell you about their experiences. We have to become much more sensitive and responsive to people's experiences, illness experiences and medicine experiences. Uh, again here, there is also a very widely prevalent box-ticking mentality patient satisfaction surveys involving patients. Every health authority is doing surveys of patients where you're satisfied with the waiting list and the consultation and so on and so on and so on. And these are closed questions. Satisfied, very satisfied, neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, dissatisfied, and then you tick that and you add it up and you give the age with the authority of score. That doesn't help mutual understanding at all because it, doesn't, it isn't clear what was satisfying and what was not satisfying, etc. We actually want what it felt like, what was it like and what was good about it and what was not as good as it should have been. So all those things, that's a change in attitude needed all the way along and that needs, learn, means learning new methods, new ways of communicating. So, as far as regulators uh, go, I think we've said enough about regulators. There are many ways in which they need to improve. They need to become open and transparent and they need to be responsive and they need to consider the public health instead of the uh, companies as their main customers, which is what happens now. So now I will turn to the, the golden rules that I'm proposing, which are really patient-centered. Now, have, have you all got them? You've all got them in your folder, but you probably haven't had time to read them. So I will go through them very fast. Get to know as much as you can about the medicines that have helped you. This is echoing uh, uh, what was just said. Second, everybody is different and you must learn how your own body reacts to medicines. That's only you know that and that's very important for anybody else who is going to treat you. Keep notes of your experiences with medicines, why you took it, how much, for how long, what happened and when, how well it worked and anything you didn't like. So that's a small diary, that's a piece of homework for everybody to do and for all the people in the family. Fourth rule, unless you have a special reason, avoid medicines that are new. Stick to those about which a lot is known from many sources and which have been used for over 10 years. Bad news about a drug often takes years to emerge. Fifth rule, before deciding to use a medicine, be clear whether it is to relieve a symptom, to cure a disease such as an infection, to remedy some deficiency, for example, a vitamin, or to prevent something. We've had tremendous muddles about this. 
uh, when people take statins, they are usually given it to prevent something. But then the, sta the statin causes something which is here and now, which is bad. So it doesn't make sense at all to prevent something in the future uh, if it's going to cause you some problem now. So it needs straight thinking on that. Sixth rule, think what you could do instead of using a medicine. For example, use a hot water bottle, go for a walk, have a comfortable bath, talk with a friend, take a rest. Those aren't on the menu normally. Seventh rule, ask a doctor or pharmacist you trust how well the medicine works, what problems people have had with it, and what happened. You can also look up the drug on the internet and discuss what you find with somebody who understands it a bit better than you do. Then eighth rule, if something bad happens that you suspect might have been caused by a medicine, report on a yellow card. And you can ask a doctor, pharmacist or nurse to help you do that or do it for you. And then there's one I've added in the light of the discussion, which is when you have a, when you have a problem about an adverse effect or something difficult to discuss with your doctor, take someone with you to the consultation because four ears are better than two and there are too many things to think about and an independent uh, uh, opinion is well worth having. You can't, and, and it's too une unequal, the discussion. We need to diminish the distance in knowledge and experience between patients and doctors. So there has to be calm listening and also some help for bridging the gap in understanding. So, I realize that not everybody may know what their responsibility is now. I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you. Um, just before everybody goes, Millie, I just want to say... Okay. Oh, can, can, can I just say very, very quickly, out of tragedy came this. And I just want to say a very personal, and I'm sure everybody here wants to say a big thank you for Millie for getting everything together. We owe her a tremendous amount. And thank you very much indeed. Thank you for everybody. I just want to say thank you. Can you start moving out while I'm talking, please? Because I don't want to upset the hall. Because I love the Quakers. I love their hall. I love the people here. They're fantastic. I don't want to upset them. I want to thank everybody, my wonderful sons, my wonderful Lucille, who's my trustee, and all my other trustees who've helped me today, and all the helpers, all the volunteers, and all of you for coming, but especially, of course, our wonderful speakers who don't get paid for this. They come because they care. Thank you.